In God we trust. That's what our currency says. One nation under God. That's what millions of school children say every day in the Pledge of Allegiance. Does that mean we have a state religion? What about a Christmas display that features a nativity scene, baby Jesus in a manger? What about prayer at a high school graduation or a high school football game? These situations raise questions under the Establishment Clause, the last clause of the First Amendment that we're going to discuss. That clause says that Congress may not make any law respecting an establishment of religion. Like the other First Amendment clauses we've discussed, this one applies not just to Congress, but to all federal actors. And, because of the 14th Amendment, not just to the federal government, but to the states as well. So now no government, state or federal, can establish a religion. We'll talk about what it means to establish a religion in just a moment. But it's worth pausing a minute here to note a little puzzle. When the drafters of the Establishment Clause said Congress could make no law respecting an establishment of religion, they meant two things. First, they meant that Congress couldn't set up an official religion for the United States, no federal establishment of religion. But second, they meant that Congress couldn't interfere with state establishments. And at the time of the founding, several states did have official religions, what we would now recognize as forbidden establishments. So it's a little tricky to see how a provision that was initially intended to protect state establishments from federal interference ends up through the 14th Amendment, becoming something that prohibits them. But it does. That's what the Supreme Court has said. So set that puzzle aside. What does the Establishment Clause mean? As with the Free Exercise Clause, there are a couple of principles that everyone agrees on, and then some that people argue about. Everyone agrees that no government can designate a religion as the official state or federal religion. And everyone agrees that no government can force people to engage in religious exercises or to profess religious beliefs. After that, things get a little murkier. One general principle that the Supreme Court has used, which came mainly from former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, is that government cannot endorse religion. The government cannot do anything to suggest that it officially supports one religion or religion in general, or that religious belief is better than non-belief. And using this principle, the Supreme Court has forbidden prayer in public schools, at graduations, and at football games. And it's forbidden some religious displays. States cannot put the Ten Commandments on the walls of schools. They can't erect crosses in front of government buildings. All those things look, maybe, like relatively straightforward endorsements of religion. But here are some complications for the non-endorsement principle. First, it's about government endorsement. Individuals are free to express themselves. So if what the government is doing is not putting up a display itself, but rather allowing private groups to put up displays in front of City Hall, and one group puts up a cross, that's OK. Second, it's about the government endorsing religion, not just recognizing the role that religion has played in our history. So if the government wants to put up a monument with the Ten Commandments, and it's one of several monuments commemorating historical sources of law, that's OK. That's not endorsement. What about a Christmas display? Well, I'm glad you asked. What the Supreme Court has said is basically that Christmas has both a religious and a secular component. If a city puts up only a nativity scene, that's religious, and it's impermissible. It's like the Ten Commandments by themselves. But Santa Claus and the reindeer are not religious. And if the city puts them up around the nativity scene, with maybe some snowmen and candy canes, then it becomes secular like the Ten Commandments, surrounded by other sources of law. It has, the Supreme Court said, the secular purpose of celebrating Christmas. You can see, I think, that these lines are hard to draw. With the high school football game, for instance, it was students who were leading the prayers. And the school policy wasn't that students should get up and lead prayers before the game. It was, on its face, just that students should get up and say what they thought was appropriate. It's hard to decide, under those circumstances, whether the prayers belong to the students, as the school argued, and which would be OK, or to the school, as the court decided, which is not OK. And some people might question some of the premises. Is there really a secular purpose to celebrating Christmas? Is Christmas a time when people of all races and religions come together to celebrate the birth of the baby Jesus? So the endorsement principle leaves us with some hard cases. Even worse, it leaves us with some cases that actually look pretty easy 
but that the Supreme Court is unwilling to decide. Putting in God we trust on the currency, or describing the United States as one nation under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, looks pretty clearly like an endorsement of religion. But the Supreme Court is not very likely to say that those things are unconstitutional. And what that means is that the endorsement test can't be the only answer, or at least that it can't be applied in all circumstances. So the Establishment Clause is an area where the Supreme Court probably has more work to do. It's an area of constitutional law that produces a lot of hard cases. And in part, again, this is because government does more than it used to. People's lives used to take place mostly in the private sphere, but now a lot of them take place inside government institutions public schools, for instance, or government workplaces. And this increasing overlap between the government and the individual means that it's harder to manage the tension between keeping the government out of religion and allowing individuals to express their religious beliefs and to mark significant moments in their lives with religious observances. High school graduation, for instance. It's one thing if public schools are relatively rare. And it's another if, as now, 90% of students are in public high schools. And what about those private schools? Many of them are religious. Are there limits on the kind of aid the government can give to them? As with the endorsement test, here we've got a couple of general principles, although you'll see again that sometimes the lines can be hard to draw. The general rule that the Supreme Court follows in deciding whether government aid to a private religious school violates the Establishment Clause is that neutrality is okay. What this means is that the government can provide support to all schools, religious and non-religious alike, on equal terms. It can't treat religious schools better because they're religious, but it doesn't have to treat them worse either. So states can provide assistance with all sorts of secular instruction, and things like computers, lunches, and buses. What about religious instruction? Obviously, the state can't say, we're going to fund only religious instruction. That would be treating religious schools better than non-religious ones. And for a while, the court followed a rule that government funds could never be used for religious instruction. But it no longer follows that in quite the same way. It's now okay for the government to pay tuition at religious schools, even though some of that money is presumably being used to fund religious instruction. It's okay as long as the tuition voucher program is neutral, and parents are allowed to take the money and send their children to non-religious schools, as well as religious ones. Because then it's the parents' choice, not the government's, that directs the money to the religious as opposed to the non-religious schools. And of course, parents are allowed to make this choice, in theory. The sticky issue in the case where the court considered this program of tuition vouchers was that almost all of the available private schools were religious. So in practice, the large majority of the government money had to go to religious schools and the government knew it. A hard case. The Supreme Court split five to four. But in the end, it said that this was still okay. Well, another illustration of the point that the Supreme Court doesn't hear easy cases, and that principles that look sensible in one context might be harder to apply when facts change. We'll see these points again as we talk about more amendments next time.